Well, hello, friends. Good to see you all. Pastor Nathan here. It's been a few days since I have posted a daily devotional. So uh, it is Friday morning right now, and I'm going to do one for Friday, and I'm going to do one for Thursday yesterday. Um, just to give you a little bit of an update, Pastor Stephen and myself have obviously been doing these videos for a couple of months now, and I think we will probably do them a little bit more sporadically in the days ahead. Um, uh, Pastor Stephen is going to do one uh, consistently on Wednesday, and as I say, I'll be doing some a little bit more sporadically. So I expect to do at least at least a couple, maybe you know, maybe two or three a week, something like that. Um, big announcement is that uh, church is going to resume this Sunday. That is uh, gathered uh, worship in in our church building, and I understand that some of you are are raring to go, and you can't wait to. Um, to come and you plan on being there on Sunday, whereas others of you just don't feel uh, safe and don't feel comfortable returning to worship yet, which we completely understand. So we are, um, th there's just a great amount of of, of understanding and respect um, on behalf of myself and, and other church leaders that, that um, it, it's up to each person when they feel uh, safe returning to worship. And uh, we've had some incredible people at the church who have given so much time and uh, and energy and effort and thought to ensuring that uh, those of you who are not going to be returning to the church building yet will be able to still participate in worship. So as of right now, the, uh, the service will be live streamed and then it will also be available for viewing after the the live stream so the details will go out about that in a um, um in, in an email i think some have already gone out um but anyway we're going to do everything we can to make sure that you who are uh, still homebound will be able to to worship so anyway for those of you who will be there on sunday morning i am very excited i feel like chris farley uh i uh, just can't wait to uh to see you all there that was a Facebook, a reference to a Facebook post from Nicole like months ago. So if you're on Facebook, scroll back and you'll see her alluding to me as Chris Farley. Uh, now on a more serious note, I want to ask you to open to Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three contains in it a section of the Bible that someone has referred to, a commentator has alluded to as the Acropolis of the Bible, like the highest point of revelation in all of scripture. Uh, I think you could probably make that case. So Romans 3, 21 to 26 is, is that section. So I would urge you not only to, uh, you know, hear the, the exposition, the brief uh, exposition that I will give, but to take time. And it's like, uh, uh, kind of bear, bore down. Is that what bore down? Um, spend time, doing your best to understand verses 21 to 26 in Romans 3. It is uh, magnificent. Um, you'll see that Romans 3 is kind of divided up into, into three sections. Um, the first one is where Paul talks about, you know, is there any benefit to being a Jew? Because he ends chapter 2 of Romans by saying, look, circumcision is not a matter for, for the Jews. It's not a matter primarily of just did you were you circumcised or not but it's 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 a matter of the heart that's what god wants god doesn't really uh the main thing for god is not are you circumcised or not you know for christians we might say are you baptized or not like that's not what god cares about primarily his main concern is is where your heart is before god so in romans 3 the beginning paul says is there then any benefit if it's just a matter of the heart why get circumcised right uh so he he talks about that and then uh, starting in verse 10, um, he begins an indictment, this unbelievable indictment that goes all the way to verse 18. It's an indictment against the human race. And it's where Paul says again and again that all people, every one of us, we are sinful. We are corrupt. We have absolutely no hope but God. And to prove his point, to, to, to prove that Paul isn't just this misanthrope, you know, someone who hates humans, a hater of humanity. He quotes the Psalms. He quotes uh, other parts of, of Scripture, right? Drawing their attention, drawing our attention to this. He starts in verse 10, verse 9. We've already charged all, both Jew and Greek, are under sin. Verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. 
Their throat is an open tomb. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps, an asp is a, a poisonous snake, is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Did you see? Did you hear that? I mean, I don't know how Paul could build a stronger case about how corrupt you and I are by nature. And it's very interesting to me that there's one part of the body, one area of the body that he continually alludes to to prove how sinful we are. And what is it? This this organ right here, the tongue, the, the mouth, right? It is the mouth is a reflection of what is in our what? What's in our hearts, right? That's why cursing and that's why uh, tearing people down with your words are so serious. It's not that the mouth did anything wrong. The mouth didn't sin when the mouth said something. It's the heart that sins, right? And the mouth is the vehicle that uh, expresses what's in, what's in the heart. So we could talk about that for a long time. It is very interesting that he says um, in verse 11, no one seeks for God. A lot of people today would say, baloney, I'm seeking after God. You know, I'm seeking after spirituality. Uh, what do you mean, Paul? No one seeks after God. How can you say that? You know, uh, I've said it this way before, that uh, people do seek after God. But who is the God that they seek after? It's not the God of the Bible, and that's what Paul's talking about. No one seeks after the true God. People seek after a God of their own devising. And there's a word for that, isn't there? It starts with an I. What is it? Idolatry. They seek after gods that they delight in. Gods that are, uh, who are, you know, very understanding about, you know, my weaknesses and my infirmities. But the same gods also uh, um, strike down my enemies, you know, that, that sort of thing. Well, he goes on in verse um, 18 and 19 to talk about the uh, um, when God delivers his judgment, every mouth will be stopped, right? Nobody will be able to speak against God. And in verse 20, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Then we come to Romans chapter 3, 21. Starting at Romans chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to this point, he has been just laying down this, like almost like a, a, a prosecutor in a court case, laying down an indictment against the human race. And then there's this great shift in verse 20. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested, has been revealed. Apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. There's not a distinction between Jew or Greek, Jew or Gentile at this point. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Just like in chapter 3, verse 10. And are justified by his grace as a gift. Justified means reckoned, counted as being righteous. Uh, counted as having the, the perfect record of Jesus. That's what justified means. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption is when there is payment made and someone is released. It's like uh, bail money or something like that, right? You go and you pay the bail money and then the, your friend or family member, whoever you're bailing out of jail, is released. That's redemption. And that's what Jesus does for us. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. A propitiation is a wrath-absorbing sacrifice. Um, Jesus makes God propitious toward us because of his death on the cross. That's propitiation. Jesus uh, took, took on himself the punishment and absorbed the wrath of God in his death. That's what propitiation is. Why? Verse 25. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. He repeats himself in verse 26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that God might be just. He is God. God might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Have you ever asked the question, how did David 
wretched King David get forgiven? Yeah. How did Noah get forgiven? How did Joshua, how did Moses, how did the saints in the Old Testament get forgiven, right? Jesus hadn't died. Romans 3, 25 and 26 tells us. God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, right? But only for a time. God, God overlooked the sins of Moses because God knew that one day his son, Jesus, would die on a cross. See, God's, God's righteous requirements have to be met. They have to be fulfilled. And Moses couldn't keep them, couldn't fulfill them. Neither could Abraham or Sarah or any of the saints in the Old Testament. And uh, that was why God displayed Jesus publicly on a cross to show, to display his righteousness. That when David murdered Uriah and uh, raped Bathsheba and killed other people in the process, God wasn't just saying, well, you're my buddy, King David. We're not going to worry about that. Where's a cosmic rug? We'll sweep that under the rug. That is not what God did. Jesus bore on the cross the punishment for David's sins on the cross because we know that David was trusting the Lord. David was trusting that one day God would send a redeemer, one of his own grandchildren, who of course is, is Jesus Christ. And so because of what Jesus did, because of what Jesus did on the cross, there's something that's unbelievable that can happen that verse 26 tells us. God can now still be the just, righteous God that he is and simultaneously the justifier, the forgiver of sins. Like, like what Jesus accomplished on the cross is awesome, is absolutely awesome. And you and I should never take that for granted because of what Jesus did. God is still the, the just, righteous God because sins were paid for. And yet, at the same time, God can also be forgiving and love you and love me. He can be the justifier. Why? Because if we are trusting Jesus, then we share in not only Jesus taking the penalty for our sins, but we share in Jesus' righteousness that is uh, imputed to us, that is counted to us by faith. And that's why Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26 are worth your knowing. Well, verse, verses 21 to 26 are worth your memorizing and meditating on and loving the God of Romans 3.